Call to order the June 21st, 2017, uh, 2018 budget hearings. Um, first, we'll have law enforcement, which will be a PowerPoint by Mr. Kevin Tobin, Sheriff Tobin. This Morning, book. Kevin Tone, Fandy County Sheriff. Yeah, I'm going to go through the PowerPoint, which is the book we okay. sent over to you. So you'll have uh, two sets of numbers. You got numbers from the auditor, which uh, I think Holly gave you that looked like these sheets. But we've consolidated some of that information here. Plus, let's talk about the different programs we're doing. And uh, so we can certainly ask questions off either sheet. And, uh, and I hope you'll ask questions as we go along. And, uh, we have a number of staff here with us, so to maximize the efficiency of your time. So if you have questions, hopefully we can answer them on the spot rather than have to do a bunch of uh, follow-up back and forth with you. So we'll try and do that uh, as we go. So I want to say thank you for the time this morning. It's a, obviously a chance for us to talk about what we do at the Sheriff's Office and our budget as it's proposed for uh, 2018. The, uh, Colleagues, I just arrow on these. So I'm going to start by division first and just go through each of the divisions a little bit and give you a, kind of an overview. And then, uh, again, please ask any questions as we go along. In the last couple of years, last three years, we've worked with the commission about adding more you know, sworn deputies and appreciate the support in doing that. And uh, you can see our calls for service continue to go up. You know, from 2014 to 2016, they've gone up 14%. And, you know, as I've said past years, it's not just the individual call for service, but oftentimes you have multiple deputies on a call for service. You may have an accident that ties up two or three or four deputies. You could have a domestic violence call or some other call that has potential for violence where you have more than one deputy going. So you know, this is really a, a minimum uh, reflection of, you know, their activity. Warrants. Uh, again, you can see our warrants continue to go up. Um, most dramatic jump is if you look from 2012 to 2016 from 975 felony warrants to uh, almost a little over 2,400 uh, felony warrants and same with misdemeanors have gone up um, if you look from 12 to 13 and then the next chart below that shows the warrants that have been served so you can see the number of warrants we're receiving have gone up the number of warrants we're serving and those served include whether it's Police Department, Sheriff's Office, Highway Patrol, any law enforcement agent that makes an arrest is counted under, under those served. And of course, we have a very active uh, warrants division, and then they work in conjunction with the United States Marshal Service. We have a joint fugitive task force with the uh, Sheriff's Office, Police Department, and Marshal Service trying to serve the violent uh, federal felony warrants. And there's a lot of crossover, of course, between you know, the felony warrants on the federal side and the state warrants. So it's important that we work them on all fronts, both federal and state, because as people are out on warrants, it's been our experience that most often they're out committing other crimes. So the quicker we get them caught and get them into the system and dealt with, the better it is and less victimization occurs. So. Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner DeSanto. Question. Is this primarily drug related, the, the increase that we're having, or is it spread out throughout the gamut of? You know, you know, I don't have a breakdown, but this is a good question, and I'll do some follow up. I mean, our drug arrests are up significantly, uh, so I, I suspect it's one of the major drivers. I don't know if it's the major driver or not. No. Thank you. Commission, just one thing. I think we're pretty laid back at these budget meetings. You won't have to address me. You can just ask your questions if that's okay is that cool with everybody okay that way we don't have to go through me that you can just ask your your staff okay. I got one more thank you thank though. you kevin when i was looking down through your what's the difference between the arrested in pennington county and for pennington county the two warrants which ones you're looking at now the arrested in pennington county under the five-year fugitive warrants oh, oh down there yeah yeah, arrested for Pennington County. Those are arrested in other jurisdictions around the state or out of state. Okay, and then brought. Okay. Yep, and then extradited back. Yep. Corner cases, you know, as, as you know, a number of years ago, the sheriff's and, the sheriff and corner office was combined, which frankly is becoming more of a trend in the state because it's a very efficient way to uh, do business at a county level in terms of combining the offices. Yeah. The uh, Corner business continues to 
increase, uh, a slight dip last year, but the year-to-date numbers already is at 168, which would put it on a pace if it stayed consistent, where we'd hit about 360 to 370 coroner cases if we stay at the current pace that we're at right now. And about 18% of those cases result in autopsies, cost of an autopsy, which is in our budget, is a little over $2,100. And that's performed by you know, Dr. Hobby at uh, Repsey Regional Hospital. Occasionally we have to go out of the area to get an autopsy done if he's not available, but he does the majority of them. We move a lot of inmates every year in our transport division. Uh, if you look at uh, the blue on the top is the um, shuttle, the trip east. You see the bus going across the state. It leaves every Tuesday and every Thursday uh, to go east. And of course, returns on Wednesday and Friday. And, you know, moved almost 7,000 people with that shuttle. And you know, we have the bus reserve that we've talked about uh, in our budget. And, to replace the bus, the last one we bought was 550000 So we do the bus reserve, so at the end of five years, you know, we're able to purchase a replacement bus and trade in the other one. So it's a cost-effective way for Pennington County because it offsets majority, if not all, of what would be our transport costs. And frankly, it's a good partnership for all the, all the other counties in the Department of Corrections because it's a, it's a cheap way for them to transport people across the state as opposed to a smaller county where you may only have two or three deputies having to run somebody to the penitentiary and then not be available for calls for service in their county. So it's been a good partnership and it works well. And then the green is just local transport. So that's back and forth to court, sometimes to medical appointments. But you, again, you can just see we move a lot of people every year uh, with our transport division. 24-7 program, you know, uh, that was started by Attorney General Larry Long. Uh, I was at DCI at the time working for Larry when he started down this path of creating 24-7, so it's been around for a number of years. It's a very effective program. It's a jail diversion. It's an accountability for offenders. And uh, you know, if you look at, again, there's growth in all areas. The largest growth is in the, the UA testing, which has become a more preferred way of testing because you can test for drugs and other things. Um, the success rate, if you look at the pass rate, you know, it's very high, 98, 99%. So it, it does work and it's a good system. And you'll see on the next slide. Mr. Tom, just, just a question. How long is the lease left on that building over there? Like a <laughs> year or something? Years, three, we have three, left. Yeah. Three, three years maybe. Okay, I thought we had less. Yeah. And is, is, are we looking for a future spot for that because that's not our building yeah the, the building's owned by the city and uh, you know 24 7 has been fairly nomadic over the years about every 18 months it was moving so we had a seven-year uh, lease with the city on this building and i know the mayor's talked about uh, making it available for other use which we told them if that happened we would you know let them out of our lease and then uh, find another home but we always kind of keep our eye open but haven't gone into panic mode looking yet because we've got three years left, hopefully. Okay. Thank you, Kip. In our budget, we're asking for 4.25 FTEs, and I'll explain those as we go through the budget, but there's a quarter of an FTE requested in 24-7, uh, and that's driven by the number of UAs that we're doing. UAs just take more time. You know, the PBTs, they walk in the door, they blow, they walk out. A UA, you got to escort them in the bathroom, of course, and watch them and you know, collect the urine sample. It just takes more time. And you can see in that previous slide how many more thousand UAs we're doing. So it would, it would uh, accommodate the growth in that area. The nice thing about this program, it's 100% offender pay. There's no tax dollars in it, so it's all offender pay. City calling, city county alcohol and drug. Of course, lots of changes coming up next year with the move to the new building. But this just shows you the activity in the different different areas. I just want to highlight about the fourth line down for methamphetamine, primary drug of abuse. You know, it's consistent with what we've seen in the community, both in violence and the crimes we've had, and just uh, meth has kind of permeated pretty much every every aspect of crime again we've had a huge resurgence in methamphetamine and uh, so 25 percent jump there and then if you jump down to the low intensity meth treatment you know 77 percent increase there was a slight decrease last year on the specialized meth program that's just because we weren't getting the referrals 
uh, Brenda tells me year to date, that's actually up. So again, methamphetamine is up in all of our programs at City County Alcohol and Drug. And if you look down on the very bottom, which says Criminal Justice Initiative Program, that's money if you remember, there's been a lot of reference to Senate Bill 70, the Public Safety Improvement Act. That's money that was put into uh, the Public Safety Improvement Act for uh, treatment in the respective communities. So we deliver a lot of those <coughs> services and get a lot of funding for programs in our community, you know, via that uh, Public Safety Improvement Act. So. Kevin, you only got two 2015 numbers. I noticed the detox numbers have increased slightly by 0.2%, and the safe beds have increased quite a bit. Did the number <coughs> for detox uh, inmates go down any when we started the safe beds? It's a question, Did are the safe beds replacing some of the detox beds? Was that that's correct? what I was thinking would, yeah, would I, probably I, happen when initiated the safe beds. As we I, I think that's accurate, and it's a more efficient use of the beds because you know, it's minimal services, you know, the safe beds or basically a harm reduction model. It's a blue mattress on the floor, get them off the street, but at the same time still have the staff do some motivational talking to them. You know, Barry and his staff go down and talk to them, make them aware of the other services, so maybe someday they'll cross over the detox side and sober up. But in the meantime, if they don't want to sober up, let's don't burn a bunch of resources on them. And so there is less use of the detox beds with the safe beds. Sheriff Tom, yeah. in the past, have we had to have specific treatments for specific drugs like meth? Or is that kind of new over the past five, 10 years? You know, meth has always been out here. I mean, I go back to my early days with the DCI out here, going back to 1982, there was a lot of methamphetamine on the street then. Wow. Um, it's, it's done a roller coaster in terms of, you know, how prevalent it is and isn't at different times. So it's been around for a long time. Hmm. The county health facility, there's been a lot of discussion about the Haven for Hope model. I know Commissioner DeSanto went on one of the trips to uh, San Antonio to look at Haven for Hope. The Haven for Hope model, you know, there's one campus, you have the Restoration Center and you have the Transformation Center, and then they have some housing on the campus as well. And the idea is to step people through and out of the system rather than keep them in the system. And they've had tremendous success at San Antonio. A number of us have been down there and looked at the program. Did you go down, Lloyd? No. Okay, I couldn't remember if you had or not. But uh, it's uh, the build, the former NAU building, which I think will forever be its name, but we're going to try and call it the Restoration Center. So we, we in our community, we would have a kind of a split campus concept where you'd have the Restoration Center, which is their former NAU building, and then the Transformation Center, which the most often talked about site right now is the Ziggy's building by the fairgrounds. And if that comes to fruition, that would be the Transformation Center. So you'd have, again, a split campus, but it works. Um, we've talked to the folks from San Antonio, they've looked at our model, and they. They speak highly of it and have confidence that it'll work even with the split campus. So, and uh, that move is scheduled to happen sometime around April of next year, where we'll actually move into the building. Of course, you know Barry Tice Health and Human Services will be on it's to the right end of the screen, the west end of the building, uh, with his administrative offices. <coughs> And the county health facility, this is the second floor on the east end, which is above the old gymnasium. This is a concept because we didn't have the money to finish off the second floor. It's about another million five or a little more to finish off second floor. And that would house residential treatment uh, programs. What I'd like to do is come back probably sometime late August or September and just do a separate uh, agenda item and talk about the second floor. And I want to talk to you about the La Crosse Street facility. Originally, we had talked about, you know, closing La Crosse Street facility and selling it and using the money for other building projects. I want to come back and propose to you that we keep it open for a couple more years in a more limited capacity until we can figure out how to fund second floor up here and get all the programs moved down. Otherwise, we lose all of our residential treatment programs in Rapid City, which means <coughs> about a million dollars in state and federal revenue we lose and services to about 232 individuals, which means there's a ripple effect somewhere else in the system. They end up at the jail, they end up at detox, they end up other places in the system. So 
I want to come back and talk to you about that and uh, just tell you where we're headed. And in addition to the million dollars a year, Department of Corrections recently received a grant, and the target is uh, females, in particular Native American females, as a diversion going to the penitentiary for uh, kind of an intensive you know, residential treatment, probation, parole sort of program. And that's $600,000 a year for three years. So really over the next three years, it will keep La Crosse Street open. It's $1.6 million in revenue, and it would be no tax support to keep it open. And, but I'll come back and talk to you more about that. Uh, the building committee <coughs> has been discussing it. Um, Kevin, sorry. I have a question on Sure. You. Last time we, and I, I apologize, I didn't make the building committee meeting yesterday. I wanted to, but uh, I'm still have concerns over the flow with, with the crisis care center and detox coming in with the one admin. And I, rem I remember, right, Barry was gonna do a flow chart and try and get the flow to see how everything works with that. Yeah. We can address it later on. I just wanted to let you know I still have that concern. Yeah. And I can follow up with you on it and maybe we can address it and when we come back and do the presentation on this. We have had discussions about it. We had Gilbert Gonzalez look at it when he came up from San Antonio for Haven for Hope. And we think we've got a way to you know, mitigate those concerns, but certainly be willing to talk about it. And the concern is mixing the populations, correct? Yeah, that's my, my concern. Yeah. So anyway, the bottom line is this part of the second floor is not being finished. Um, you know, the county has spent a tremendous amount of money already. Um, I want to see if we can find whether well, there's grant funding, some philanthropy support, some other programs to try and figure out how to finish off second floor long term. But we'll we'll come back and talk about that. One of the other initiatives that impacts you know, the jail and uh, City County is uh, the MacArthur Foundation. You've heard a lot of discussion over the last two years on this. Yeah. The MacArthur Foundation, based out of Chicago, put up $75 million for what they called the Safety and Justice Challenge. And the goal was to reduce local jail populations at the same time still keeping you know, communities safe. And uh, you know, there was 200 agencies that applied. Uh, it was cut to 20. We made the cut of 20. They went from 20 to 11 for what they call the big money. We didn't get the big money in the first go round. Uh, we've received about a half million dollars from MacArthur in terms of actual cash and technical assistance. We just submitted our grant in June. And if, if we're successful, which everybody feels very optimistic, um, it'd be a million dollars this year, a million dollars the following year to implement the programs you see listed on the screen. And that's what we built our uh, submittal around. So that would require some additional uh, FTEs and that we spread over sheriff's office, uh, maybe state's attorney, health and human services, I don't know where they'd all land, uh, be spread over several different uh, offices and departments. I talked to the auditor about how do we handle this, we get the grant. You know, the problem is the timeline on the grant award is September, October. So if we got it in September, we could come back to the commission and ask to put it into the 18 budget if it's after, of course, October 1st we'd come back and ask for a supplement for the 2018 budget and using 100% of the grant funds. So just putting it on your radar, and I know the state's attorney and uh, you know Barry may talk about it as well because it impacts potentially their okay, programs. Is that, <clears throat> yeah. is that similar to the JDAI, is my understanding? It, 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 it's kind of the adult version of JDAI. Okay. But yep. so they're doing the Ray. Uh, that, that was my question, Lloyd, was also was, did they start the Ray program basically on the adults? And when it's, did they start? We haven't started yet. It's proposed. Um, yeah. The timeline estimate, Brian. End of August, beginning of September. Okay. End of August, September. We're looking at a risk assessment instrument for scoring adults like we do for juveniles. And you know, the question is, should somebody sit in jail for $75 because they can't, don't have 10% you know, $750 bond, they don't have 10% for a bondsman. It costs us $80 a day for them to sit there, but they don't have $75 a day to post the bond or somebody else may. So can we use this tool to screen for risk and get people out without a cash bond? And that, still the program, same. that program and why they're, they're mimicking it with adults is because it's worked um, very well in diversion programs for juveniles. So... Now they believe that they can do the same with adults, and then they have this program with Ray and different things from the county. That's why I said the county's kind of leading the way on diversion programs on what we're doing through different states, not just South Dakota. So yeah. it's pretty exciting. 
<coughs> jail population, again, jail has trended up, but that's largely driven by our federal numbers, which I'll talk about in more detail. The, uh, again, under MacArthur, our goal is a 20% 20, 20 reduction in our local county jail population. And we've also done things looking at like our, our, our workflow with the courts. Is there more efficient ways to get people through the system that we get a judgment of conviction and somebody's going to the penitentiary. Sometimes it was taking two or three weeks and they were sitting here in the county jail. Now we're doing it within days and we get them on the bus and get them off to the Department of Corrections and get them off of our dime, so to speak. The uh, electronic monitoring, uh, we started that back in 2013. And those are people that would have been in the jail but are now on uh, bracelets. We've expanded that. We started uh, a pilot with uh, pretrial electronic monitoring. So if uh, somebody's marginal on whether or not the judge is comfortable releasing them, but if we can release them with additional accountability and increases the judge's um, comfort level, then we'll put them on a bracelet. So we're just piloting it with a couple of the judges, just having about three to five people on the bracelets right now on pretrial EM, but it's an area we're venturing off into. So the work release, you're not doing as many work release it, it's as, gone down from what it was. Right. Um, What's uh, the population on work release now that you have? Do you know, Kev? Oh, I looked at the sheet this morning. Was it today, Six. Rob? Do you remember? It was in, in the 40s this morning. I looked at the sheet. I don't remember. It was low 40s, if I remember right. It's also more cost efficient. Correct. By, and it's, and by it's let, offender, electronic it's, monitoring. And it's offender pay. Again, the offender pays for the cost of the electronic monitoring. But again, then you have work release, and, and when I was using um, work release for a lot of the cleanups and stuff, it seemed like the same people were going in and out. So I guess for me, the electronic monitoring made more sense, and hopefully we're teaching them in work release how to, um, you know, life skills. Because if, they're, if they keep coming back, and, and do we have those kind of classes and stuff when they're doing work release and, and uh, any electronic monitoring? Do they have to go to classes or anything? Well, it depends on if the court has ordered some programming. Sometimes the courts order programming to go along with their sentence, then they will be attending. could be like an AA or NA class, right. uh, Narcotics Anonymous. The, uh, it's up to the court to decide the programming. We just do the monitoring and the day-to-day -day accountability, the random UA testing, those sorts of things. I guess, well, I did that program for about five years, and it seemed like there was a lot of recidivism back then. And that was when I was with the council. Um, so I just didn't know if we had changed up how we do that program or, or we're doing something different and electronic monitoring is taking over that because it's more efficient. With electronic monitoring, one, it's a higher degree of accountability on the offender, and two, we've actually seen a lower number of, call them escapes, so basically a walk away, failure to come back from work release with electronic monitoring than we did previously when people came back to the jail every night and turned themselves back in and left in the morning to go back to work. So I think it works. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. You know, the marshals, uh, inmates, I want to spend some time talking about this. This is a, you know, it's a, it's a big revenue stream for Pennington County, of course. And the other thing is it provides a service that, frankly, nobody else could provide. The federal courts here in Rapid City, um, you know, a few years ago, one day we hit a low of 60, uh, you know, federal inmates. These are all generally pretrial. Once they get convicted and then in sentence, they go off into the Federal Bureau of Prisons. But we hit, we hit bottomed out at about 60. Well, this morning, to put it in perspective, we're sitting at 184. And the, uh, I think that's a function of several things. The, uh, of course, our task force that we use has been very active in rounding people up. But, you know, reservation crime is, you know, off the charts. If you look at, uh, you know, per capita on Pine Ridge with 17 homicides last year, that's four times the rate of Chicago in terms of homicides. So it's off the chart uh, with violent crime. That's, again, fueled by large part methamphetamine. And then what happens is the federal court system gets so loaded up with cases, it's hard to get, you know, that many cases through the system. So this kind of <coughs> compounds itself. The, the marshals have said, don't be surprised if you hit close to 200. I don't know if we can take 200. I mean, it's... You know, there's that many people in the system uh, right now. You can see our average daily population has uh, just continued to increase. And of course, you know, we use that when we look at our revenue projections, trying to figure out, you know, um, our revenues and expenditures in our budget. And 
you know, it's been a little bit of a, a moving target. Uh, we always try and err on the high side to protect the county so we don't come in uh, needing money at the end of the year. But it's, uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide here. Here's, here's some data for you just to give you an idea of impact, you know, fiscally to the, the Mr. county. Mr. Tom, you know, just, just one question. Yeah. How many, um, what's the capacity of the jail right now? If you had a button in every bed, it'd be 624, but that's not practical. Um, when you get into classifications, classification, example, gender, male, female, and then other classifications from there based on propensity for violence, those sorts of things. And that includes all the uh, beds and booking. They say in a direct supervision jail, when you hit about 90%, generally you're considered full. So we're running pretty close to capacity. So when you do the remodel, is that going to add more beds, or is it just because of some of the deficiency in the infrastructure and stuff in the jail? It would do both. It would uh, update the laundry and kitchen, and the goal is to add additional beds, in particular, down in booking. And then later on in here, I'm going to come up quick shortly here, I'm going to talk about we're going to move some of this population out to uh, the JSC. But, but here's... Uh, Again, just some numbers and look at impact. We built uh, this year's budget based on 110 marshals. Of course, we're way above that. So we, you can see we upped the 2018 budget based on 115 U.S. marshals. Now, you know, the, the danger in that is it's, it's just shy of 30,000 a year per inmate. So if it goes down by 10, that's $300,000. So need to leave a little margin of error in there to protect the county, again, on the high side. Just some jail little factoids for you and spend a lot of time on them. Just gives you uh, some ideas to the volume of uh, traffic through the jail. And the meals served, that's just the jail. We, we centralized our food service and our laundry, but our, so the for detox, you know, city, county, alcohol and drug programs for the juvenile services center, those meals are also prepared at the jail. So it's probably a little over 700,000 meals a year. High volume, not particularly good quality food, but anyway. Jail garden, you've heard a lot about that, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, it's often growing again this year. Um, use a lot of trusty work out there, and you can see the fruits of our labor, literally, in terms of what we produced last year. I'm gonna stop for a sec. On the, we have video court appearances by inmates. Pardon? I didn't know we had video court appearances by inmates. How does that work? Yeah, every morning, particularly Monday mornings, we can have up to 80 in there. Uh, right behind this control, central control room on the main floor there, there's a okay. video courtroom and we do video appearances in there, which saves us a lot of transportation back and forth, so. I, I never knew you did that, so. Yeah. Wow. I'll have to see, come over and see how that works. I wanna talk about some of the challenges working in corrections. I apologize for the blood and guts, so to speak, on the photo, but um, you know, we have high turnover in corrections, and it's challenging. And like all of our programs, we're 24-7, 365. So when people are home sleeping or they're home on holidays, we have people that are still working. Uh, this is one of the um, suicide attempts we had recently. Uh, last year, we had 17 suicide attempts at the main jail, uh, which, of course, uh, none of them were successful. They're just attempts. Um, but the staff is very diligent about you know, paying attention to what's going on and intervening as quickly as possible. There's another suicide attempt. This was a, a parole violator that was scheduled to go back to the, um, the pen. Um, and as a result of this, you know, one officer was transported to medical uh, clinic for treatment for blood exposure because you have bloodborne pathogens you have to deal with. And so it's a <coughs> challenging environment. Kevin, I just want I, I just want to take a moment and thank Brian and Andy. I was in a, a conference meeting with the Civil Rights Commission Advisory mm -hmm. Bill, and they'd gotten a concern over the, the facilities at the jail, and the lack of information about knowing about the suicide room sparked a lot of uh, controversy. And once, Luckily, I was here during the conference and was able to contact and we dispelled the, the rumor really mm -hmm. quick. Yeah. So I, was, I just wanted to thank Brian and, and Andy and everybody for getting back to me so quickly while I was in the conference on the phone. So. The, uh, this is some feces that was written on the wall. Waited out the three letters after F, but you can guess what it is. Um, 
Commissioner Hadcock, I think you were down there that morning doing a tour. And uh, so it's just, again, some of the challenges that correctional staff face. And then this page and the following page just detail out a number of incidents where staff have been assaulted by inmates while they're you know, working in the facility. I always tell everybody more, it's, it's, it's not Otis and Andy and Mayberry, it's a different population. And uh, everything from disorderly conduct to you know, potential death row cases start in county jails and work their way through the system before they go off into the penitentiary. We ran the numbers a couple weeks ago, I think it's probably gone up since then. There was 29 people in the jail charged with uh, murder. Some have been convicted, some hadn't yet. And, uh, about half of those are federal cases, about half of them state cases, but gives you some ideas to the level of you know, violence and the offenders we deal with at the jail. So Kevin, Tom, um, is most of the turnover in the area where it's basically hands-on with the inmates, like you know, the, where we were um, booking them and, and different areas, or is it just? Yeah, it's, it's mostly in the correctional officers. And those are the ones that are doing the hands-on supervision of the inmates. Yep. That's where I'm seeing it. It takes a toll. So the Life Enrichment Center, which was some female beds we had out at uh, JSC, the pink area, is what was we were using for Life Enrichment Center, part of an extension of City County Alcohol and Drug. We closed that. We're converting it to secure detention for the jail so it can house up to uh, 28 beds out there, and that'll give us a little breathing room at the jail. Unfortunately, long term, I think over the next two to four years, we're probably going to need that space back for juvenile bed space as the population continues to grow again. This is the second floor. So there's, there's four uh, FTEs requested as part of the uh, jail staff, and that's to accommodate this expansion out at the uh, JSC. It's a max unit, so it's a separate entrance exit, so they aren't. They're sight and sound separated from the juvenile, so we meet all the state and federal requirements. But this just lays out, you know, <coughs> again, the FTEs we're requesting are 100% funded by other funds, not tax support. And so what happens in, in our world is if that revenue goes down, the numbers go down, we don't need the staff, we can let the staff, you know, go and reduce that cost as well. Have they had this layout before? Pardon? Anywhere else where they put in a facility where they or they put adults, they're not in this, I, already, I know they're not in the same facility and there's locked, but have you ever had a layout where you had juveniles and adults? I mean, you had the women in there, I remember yep. before, but yep. do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, we, we did, we had adult female offenders out there the last couple of years, so. Right, yep. so now we'll be all, so for the adult offenders, it's gonna be what, it, it, it could be male and female. There's two different pods, and then we're going to make it our uh, trustee unit. So the outside trustees that do go outside and work, these are all low-level offenders, so okay. they're low-maintenance. Okay. So we can do it with minimal staffing. Thank you, Kevin. Yep. I appreciate that. I just want to, one comment before I go into the JSC. The, uh, you know, last year we spent $572,000 on overtime at the jail. And that's because we're short correctional staff and because of the constant turnover. And what that does, that impacts, you know, staff morale, burnout, turnover, all those things get impacted. So trying to get our staffing back up so we aren't spending half a million dollars in overtime. You never eliminate overtime completely, but we spent almost $600,000 last year. Juvenile Services Center, the... Uh, you can see our federal numbers have gone up, but we've talked about that before. That's because we're one of three sites for the Federal Bureau of Prisons. The, uh, if you look in 2012, that's when JDAI was implemented. I think the two years before that, as they were discussing, planning, um, getting it on the radar, I think you've seen some informal reduction starting to happen there. And then in 2012, JDAI was uh, fully implemented. So. Oh. Kevin, can you break down, I, I know because I went to the meeting with the JSC of how many federal, is, is this the breakdown of the federal um, yep. the federal compact suit. and some of the, does that make sense? Because if, if you haven't been out to JSC or if you haven't been to the meetings, there's 
um, federal kids where you get money and then there's the compact and then there's um, yep. just the, our people. It was originally set up as a seven county compact. Now it's six, Mead County opted out. The uh, So there's, we house for other counties, we house for compact counties, which we're part of. Then we house for uh, feds, both uh, Bureau of Prisons, U.S. Marshals, and then occasionally house for Department of Corrections at state level. The average is about 41, 42. The average daily population? Yeah. That, that'd be the top graph. Uh, so about 35 last year, but it's, again, trending up beyond that. This morning, I think we're sitting at 39, and that does not include the kids over in the Arise Center, which is a partnership with Lutheran Social Services. They run as one of the uh, alternatives for us. Okay. Thank you. Just admission data, as you can see again, when JDI started, look at its secure detention and then what it is to, it was in 16, but you have some corresponding increases in the reception center and then into the shelter care that that's where more kids are diverted. And for a period of time, their juvenile crime was down in the country. I think you're starting to see the pendulum swing back the other way. The other thing that's happened is other smaller Juvenile facilities in the region have closed, so we've become regionally kind of one of the only games in town, so to speak. Some of the alternative programs we're doing at JSC, again, we've talked about these before, but the Arise Youth Center, again, a partnership with uh, Lutheran Social Services. We do home detention. We do electronic monitoring for juveniles. We've actually done that longer than we have for adults, but it's a way to keep kids accountable. Then the same thing on the next two pages is just incidents and some pictures of uh, challenges at uh, the Juvenile Services Center. Uh, last year we had five suicide attempts at the Juvenile Services Center as compared to 17 at the adult, but you know, you get 500 and some people a day on the adult side. You're running, you know, 35, 40 a day on the juvenile side. Into some of the graffiti, of course, we always clean that up right away, um, keep the facility looking clean so it doesn't perpetuate itself and encourage additional graffiti and misconduct. Volunteers, we couldn't do it without our volunteers. We're, we're very blessed in our community, uh, thankful for the support we get in our volunteers. Uh, just for example, our senior volunteers last year contributed about 1,448 hours of volunteer time. Then you can see by uh, breakdown on top from our cadet programs to our chaplains to you know, search, search and rescue, uh, reserve deputies. And then we have a lot of people that come into the jail, JSC doing uh, you know, religious programs, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, Drum Group, uh, Talking Circle, a wide variety of programs that are hosted in our facilities. Again, couldn't do it without the 223 volunteers. So budget stuff, that's really why we're here, I guess. These are uh, some summary pages. Again, they'll be a little bit different than the sheets that you got from the auditor's office, but we can talk about both uh, if you have questions off either of them. This is just a staff summary just shows, you know, every year we give you an update as to, you know, how many are in each division, how many we've moved where, um, just to keep you abreast of that. And then this shows a 4.25 uh, requested increase, and in, it's in this year's budget. Again, none of those are tax support. This is our expenditures. Um, so our total budget is about 33.5 million uh, for the sheriff's office if we spent everything. And, you can see the increase down there. And again, it's broken down uh, by the various divisions and programs. And I'm just gonna kind of fast forward through these so we can ask specific questions. And this is our revenues. One thing unique about the Sheriff's Office budget, you know, if you look at 2018, we're projecting a little over $15 million in revenue. We do run it very much like a business and about 46% of the sheriff's office budget is supported by other revenues other than you know the tax support we're talking about here today with the uh, Panty County property tax dollars. So it's, uh, I think we're very entrepreneurial in how we do business and frankly, Sheriff Holloway, Holloway is the one that started this and set it up. So he, he gets a credit, we just continued it. So tax support needed, again, by division. And I'll show you another summary page. Our tax support requested is actually 
a little over 206,000 less than last year. That'd be the red. Um, so that's, that's a good number. And this is a, a summary uh, page of the last few years of, you know, we often refer to them as you know, over collected or underspent um, dollars in our budget. So since 2013, we'll have turned back about $5.1 million. That 2017 number at a half million is actually uh, very conservative. The, uh, you know, Commissioner Farabee and I have had several discussions uh, along this line. And, you know, my goal is to protect the county in terms of uh, error on the high side. And, you know, with our budget in 2018, even a 3% variance is almost a million dollars. So I try and run it as close as we can without putting us in jeopardy because if I under project this and come to you in October and say I'm 500,000 or a million dollars short and you've already done the budget and there's no more money to spend, now we're in a bind. And the money you do get that reverts, you still get to spend it, you just gotta wait and spend it the next year so it carries over. And one last slide here. You know, in 2016, you can see what we requested in tax support. This was per the commission guidelines. That didn't include the transfer from Health and Human Services up to WASH. You just moved from one budget to another to make it more efficient to run it. In 17, we asked for 358,000 less. And this year, we asked for 206,000 less. But if you add the coal and steps back in, it actually becomes a $438,000 increase. Our objective, and I believe it's the objective of the other elected officials and department heads, was to minimize our operational cost increase, minimize FTE increases that required tax support, to give the commission as much flexibility as possible to implement the COLA and steps that have been you know, talked about and discussed. And this is our effort to contribute towards that. So with that, I'll shut up and see what other questions you may have. So a lot of information to throw at you, but it's our chance to just talk about what we're doing and then, uh, and why we're doing it. And so I'll certainly stand for any of the questions you have and haven't paid attention to the time. What time is it? Okay. Did, did workman's comp change, guys? Because that's where I'm seeing all the percentages that are higher. What's the difference on workman's comp? 23.4%. there. 146 on HIDTA grant. Yeah, that's from requested by the auditor, that number. So they, they tell us a number and we plug it in so the auditor's office can answer it. That workman's comp increases. Okay. Board, any other questions for Sheriff Tom? All right, Mr. Buskard. I uh, no, not this time. And certainly if you have any follow-up questions uh, down the road, we'd be glad to answer them. I know there's a lot of information here and a lot of information in the budgets. And um, so, and Commissioner DeSanto, I know you've asked a couple times about uh, search and rescue and other funding streams, and we've done some research on that, and I got some information I'm gonna leave with you, and hopefully that'll answer some of the questions. that We've canvassed a number of other counties and jurisdictions, see how they're doing it. And at the end of the day, it's difficult to charge and collect, but this kind of this email from Lieutenant Wood kind of lays it out, and I'm going to leave that with you, and then we can follow up if you'd like. And then, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, there's a state statute here that I've included as well. That if somebody drives around like the snow barricades when there's a blizzard, there actually is a, a state law that allows you to uh, civilly collect the costs of recovery on people that are stranded in those situations. Okay, so, good. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you, Sheriff Tom. That's it? That's it. You guys are pretty easy on me. You? <laughs> Don't have all your coffee yet. State's attorney's up next, so you can rough him up. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for everybody coming today. He doesn't have as many people backing him up. <laughs> he doesn't have as many people backing him up like you do. No one's going to stay at it's because we're a rough, tough crowd. Just tease him about his little thing sticking up there.
Was that right? Is to go. <laughs> Should we start right away, or do you guys want to break? Yeah, let me see the back of your hair. Just kidding. <laughs> when you came up, I was like, your hair is like spiking up. <laughs> I have to tease you. I think I can live with it. Okay, state's attorneys. Where are you at? Very bottom. Thank the sheriff. You're right. Everybody got their books where they need to be. <clears throat> Binders aren't working. So. <clears throat> Everybody ready? Yeah, you go. Ahead. All right. Good morning. Uh, Mark Vargo, Pennington County State's Attorney. And I want to start with something that uh, probably should have been in the budget originally, and I'm just going to tell you that it was really more of an oversight on my own part. I had told you last year that the spot that we got under the MacArthur grant for the data analyst would sunset, and we included that because we we're hopeful that we'll have that MacArthur grant, but on this round of the budget, I'm actually going to be removing that. So there'll be one less FTE than you're actually looking at right now. Um, because I think that I should live up to what I told you. If we get the MacArthur funding, as the sheriff just mentioned, in September, we would ask to put it in this budget if we have to do it as a supplement once we get that per grant. And I will tell you that the grant certainly looks very hopeful, which is kind of why I was thinking of this as being not a, do a done deal, but certainly something that we were hoping for uh, the MacArthur Foundation has not only uh, been very positive about our submission this year, um, but some of the people that they actually use routinely uh, worked with us directly and helped create the data that they're going to be relying on. And my office has been asked specifically in the last couple of months to attend national seminars on behalf of MacArthur presenting some of the things that we're doing locally in Pennington County that are innovative and that they want us to be talking about. I'd be very surprised if after they take that kind of an approach, uh, if they aren't interested in seeing those continue as part of our MacArthur Foundation application. But we will be removing one FTE from this uh, budget request pending the results of the MacArthur uh, Foundation application. Other notable changes that you're going to see in the budget from last year, you'll see increased income under the Juvenile Diversion Program. Last year, we really couldn't predict very well what we were expecting to get out of juvenile diversion, the incentive that came under Senate Bill 73. We ultimately received a little over $130,000 to the county uh, based on our performance, which was by far and away the best in the state. Not only did we have more submissions to juvenile diversion than Minnehaha County with twice the population, uh, we had just around 500. They were somewhere around 300. We also had a success rate over 80%, uh, whereas theirs was in the mid to upper 50s. So we did an outstanding job and we were rewarded for that. So I have increased that uh, anticipated budget line. I didn't increase it anywhere near the 130,000 because again, I think the commission prefers that we be cautious with that. And there is certainly the possibility, it's a state program. That state program definitely has a, it has a cap and so if the other counties catch up and they start doing things the way we're doing them, then there's some possibility that we'll run into the cap and we won't be getting 50 bucks a head, we'll be getting a pro rata share of that. So there, there's definitely a possibility that we won't be at 130,000, but I budgeted, I thought, uh, conservatively for 65,000 in that. You will see, though, decreased income on the DUI grant. That's a federal program um, for which we had three FTEs that were directly paid for. Uh, but that program has been cut in half on a national scale, and so statewide, the program recipients have simply been told that you're getting half as much money. When we got those positions, I told the commission that they were positions that we needed, regardless of whether they were grant funded or not, and we, I, I am asking the, the commission to continue to fund those. Uh, we only have four people in our misdemeanor division. We have four magistrate judges, so every state's attorney, deputy state's attorney, is essentially handling one entire judge's worth of caseload, which if you look around the state and around the country, that's an extraordinarily high level of caseload, even for a misdemeanor division. We are holding the line on Marcy's Law, as I explained to you right after the election. 
proportionally, what we were doing that was required, man, mandated by VOCA and VAWA was about a little over 1,000 cases a year. Marcy's law brought over 2,000 cases, additional cases, into that pantheon. So our victim advocacy had to go from just over 1,000 to just over 3,000. And rather than double the staff, we asked the commission for four FTEs. I think those people are awfully busy, but at the moment I think that we can still make it work and we are going to hold the line uh, rather than ask for any additional FTEs for our victim advocates. We are increasing our witness budget by 57,000. Uh, if you compare it though to the public defender's line that you'll be hearing about next, they asked for an increase of 210,000. Um, and as the commission is well aware, uh, we handle all of the murders, they handle some of the murders. Um, so I think that given the fact that we largely have to respond, we often forego having wit expert witnesses in particular, um, but on occasion, particularly when psychiatric or psychological questions are raised by the defense, we don't have much choice and we have to respond in kind. But we did feel that it was appropriate simply to leave that at 57,000 or to increase it by 57,000. I would like you though to look at last year as illustrative of what we will be doing with that money, which is that last year we asked for a total of 57,000 for 2016. Uh, we spent 14,000 and we reverted the additional 42 back to the county. We do not spend it if we don't have to. And I would like that to kind of resonate with you throughout. If you look at our 2016 budget, we turned back $282,000 uh, to the county from the budget that the county commission gave us. I think that shows that we are being appropriate stewards of the county's money, that we are taking what you give us, we're using it when we need to, but we are not just you know, coming to November and saying, okay, how many new computers, how many new toys can we buy? Uh, that's never been the way I've wanted to do business and it will never be the way that I want to do business. We are certainly facing challenges uh, for fiscal 18. Um, as the sheriff just mentioned, our crime trends are exactly in the wrong direction. We're bucking a national trend. Uh, we have managed to have both crime and violent crime increasing when the numbers nationally are decreasing. Uh, I think that part of that is related to uh, a methamphetamine surge as opposed to a heroin and opiate surge. Uh, heroin and opiates are very destructive and dangerous drugs. People who are on heroin, for instance, are going to commit crimes when they look for their next fix. The difference between that and methamphetamine is that people who are looking for the next fix with methamphetamine will commit crimes. People who are on methamphetamine are also committing crimes. People on heroin tend to be lying in a corner and doing virtually nothing, uh, sometimes dying in that corner because nobody notices uh, that they've stopped breathing. So it is an absolutely destructive and expensive proposition for a community, but methamphetamine is very different. Rapid City has always been a meth pure city. In the 80s when the cocaine epidemics were huge across the country, we were still a meth pure area. And that has now expanded unfortunately to our neighboring reservations that we work with and Pine Ridge is seeing the result of that. There were years when I worked as a, an assistant U.S. attorney when we would have one homicide on Pine Ridge, and they've got 17 in, six, in 2016. So those numbers bear out what I've always said, which is that methamphetamine is a leading indicator of violence. Um, the case that we just closed, the Ed Lowry, uh, the journal employee who was murdered uh, in North Rapid, that was methamphetamine-fueled both by use beforehand, and they took the money and they went and bought more of it. So we anticipate that that is going to continue. So the increase in drug cases that the sheriff documented uh, and that we can point to, again, we went from uh, 500 and some in 2008 to 950 in 2016. So we haven't quite doubled over the course of eight years. That's a huge number for a community of this size. One of the other unintended consequences, or I believe unintended consequences, of Marcy's law has been an increase in restitution hearings. And I've told the commission at various times in the past that it's not just the number of cases that we deal with, it's also a style of practice that is anticipated or demanded by the courts, by the other court resources. Um, every time the, this commission increases the amount of public defenders we have, we see more motion work, we see more uh, restitution hearings, we see more 
expansive sentencing hearings. When they hire witnesses, expert witnesses, we have to respond in kind, at least at times. We have changed the bar. And one of the things that Marcy's Law did by making the restitution hearings uh, essentially mandatory, I asked my staff to go back and just compare a random month of 2017 with a random month of 2016, so before and after. I think they picked April. And I don't remember the exact number of restitution hearings that we had this year, but the important thing is we had none during that entire month in the previous year. Those hearings tend to be very complex. Again, sometimes there are experts involved in terms of valuation, repairs, injuries to a person, medical bills, those kinds of things. Uh, and certainly every dollar counts because every defendant is, is interested in uh, paying as little as possible. So all of those change a little bit uh, what we are doing in terms of how we have to practice when we go over to court. And every time more time is demanded, it leaves less time to deal with the caseload, uh, and it decreases the number of cases that a person can realistically handle without burning out. And that's a very real problem, uh, I think, for us. Uh, the other thing that Marcy's Law may impact here down the road, and I want to kind of segue here, uh, into the next section that I wanted to talk to you about, which is I know that you think of us, and frankly most of the community thinks of us, as the people who prosecute. We're the people who put people in jail. We go to court. We make arguments. We try cases. And that's absolutely one of the huge drivers of what we do. But it is the things that we do outside of the courtroom and outside of the criminal justice system that I think get lost in the shuffle. Now, you are certainly cognizant of the uh, value that our civil division has to you, to the county agencies, the department heads, and the ways that they rely on us. But one of the other things, or one of the other examples, and I'm just gonna go through a list of them, but one of the other main ones that I wanna talk about just the last few week, the last week or so, the Attorney General's office came out with another opinion on Marcy's Law. And I'm hoping they're wrong again. I think they were wrong on their first one, and I'm hoping they're wrong on this one, because what they said is, you can't collect money as a government agency from a defendant who still owes restitution. Because Marcy's law says the victim has the right to restitution ahead of payments to the government. Now my reading of that, or my hope that the courts would read it, as saying if the government is also owed restitution, we take a back seat. So if a drunk driver hits a patrol car and then hits a private citizen's car, that citizen gets paid first. We don't have any problem with that. But the sheriff just talked to you about offender pay programs. So our 24-7, our electronic monitoring, we can do those, increase public safety, and decrease cost to the counties because we make the offender pay on an ongoing basis. If the attorney general's opinion is to be believed, if they are correct in their assessment of it, then we are talking about a situation where we can't collect those fees from any defendant who still owes restitution. That's a lot of them. Uh, so it would become a situation where virtually every property crime, virtually every violent crime, we would not be able to use electronic monitoring or 24-7, at least not as an offender pay program. We would have to either do it as the county bearing the cost or the, um, some other mechanism to get around it, maybe through a third party creating a, a private. Now, I don't think that's what the bill means. I don't think that's what the constitutional amendment means any more than I think it means that when they go to get their license plates that we can't take their money because they still owe restitution. That's how broadly the language is written. I think that you can make the argument that it should be tied back to the actual language of the statute, which is about a single criminal case. It is not about every interaction between the government and this defendant. But again, that's where the Attorney General's opinion is right now. We're going to have to be the ones taking the lead uh, with the Sheriff's Association, the, police, the Chief's Association, to try to make sure that we get this clarified as much as it can be in the legislature or to create a test case and take it up to the Supreme Court. So that's just another example of where we come in and the things that we do that hopefully save the county money and increase the community safety that aren't just courtrooms, aren't just trials. All of you are aware of what regional health did to us with mental illness recently. The number of hours that Jay and I put into that and that we still put into it, the number of hours the sheriff put into that, trying to rectify that situation and clarify it and fight to make sure that we still have appropriate places to put people can't be overstated. When the auditor has election controversies, we become the person that gets consulted. 
When the sheriff's office wants to implement or change electronic monitoring, we're their attorney. Um, UJS bond reform, the police department cite and release, which is one of the three things that we talk about under MacArthur, but that we're already doing to try to induce MacArthur. Again, we were integrally involved in deciding how that would work, what it would look like, what the rules would be. Uh, Department of Social Services, Open Meetings Commission, Jay Alderman basically answers every question there is from anybody that wants to run a charity lottery or a casino night or any of those things. The Gaming Commission, you would think, might be able to step in for it, but we tend to be the people, the ones that people call, and we are the locals, so we take care of that. Alcoholic beverage is the same, out, uh, the same way. And then I want to touch base just a little bit on our Young Adult Diversion Program because that's one of the things under MacArthur that we've highlighted and it's one of the things that has gotten us not only statewide but national attention. Um, I was just in Chicago, paid for by the agency that wanted me to come, and I had an attorney go out to D.C. To, the, to a national prosecutor's organization to talk about what we're doing with Young Adult Diversion. We have ramped up, and you were aware uh, I think in general what the program looks like. We take nonviolent misdemeanors and some low-level felonies, again nonviolent, and we give offenders between 18 and 25 an opportunity to go through whatever we believe is the most impactful version of some of the probation conditions that might otherwise be set ahead of time. And if we're successful with that, if they're, they succeed, and by the way, most of these programs are on a success rate of getting through the program at about 50 to 60 percent. We're running just over 90 percent success rate. And I think that's a relationship to Marty Kraus, who runs it for us, who absolutely talks to each of these kids and puts them in the right spot, not just saying, okay, you stole something, go, go to moral recognition classes. You were drinking, go talk to Lifeways. He really get, digs deep with them and figures out where they belong. If they successfully complete, uh, we are sealing and expunging not only their case, but their actual arrest. And so the co collateral consequences outside of the court system, we started this based on marijuana and petty theft cases. Marijuana and petty theft, the average cost that you pay to the court system was 650 bucks. Attorney's fees, drug testing fees, court costs, etc. $650. Now for some of our kids on, from more affluent families, Mom and dad paid it, and we had no impact on the offender. From some of the kids at risk, with very little in the way of resources, nobody paid it, and all they did was try to run from the cops because they knew they had an outstanding obligation. So we decided that that didn't make a lot of sense, particularly when you consider the collateral consequences that came from other people. The federal government quit prosecuting marijuana cases, effectively, uh, under the Holder Attorney General's office, and yet, if you have a marijuana conviction from a state court, you can't get a federal job. You can't work on a contracting firm that's doing federal work. You can't get a student loan to go to Western Dakota or USD or anywhere else. So a government that's not interested in anything about marijuana and enforcing its own laws on marijuana is still influencing hugely the collateral consequences that somebody's facing. We thought that was wrong. And so what we did was we're giving those kids a chance to invest in themselves. When you think about Senate Bill 70, it shoved down a number of offenders from the pen to the locals, put them on probation. Well, just like every classroom has that two, three naughty kids that take up about half the teacher's time, those are the most at-risk offenders on a probation officer's calendar, and they take up a huge amount of time. And these kids that we're looking at that we would like to just, you know, give them a minor tweak and get them on the right road, they were basically being ignored. Don't pee hot, don't get rearrested. Don't see me again. Good luck. That is not a plan. And so that's something that we've been doing that, like I said, has not gotten not only uh, regional but national attention. I think the program has been absolutely uh, stunning in the way that it's been worked. I credit uh, Carolyn Olson, who started it, and Marty Krause and Liz Heidelberger, who Liz Hassett now, who uh, have absolutely brought it up to, to speed. We're running probably between 400, and anticipating 400 to 500 youth going through this program in 2017. And we are keeping very good statistics based on that data analyst that you guys paid for, or that MacArthur paid for through you. Um, 
we will be tracking how well these people do after the program is over. Like I said, we're doing great on getting them through the program. We've got some work to do to figure out just what it means. Mark, did uh, when I'm looking on that light item, it looked like in 2016 your budget for 131.5 for the diversion, and and then I look over your estimating five. That's correct. That's because I worry that since there's a net statewide cap on that. So what the state said is we will pay you X amount. I don't remember it was 50 or $100 off the top of my head, Commissioner, but they pay you X amount per kid that you put through diversion. But they had a cap on that total budget. If more people put in for it than, you know, than they have money for, then you get a pro rate of share of that. So in other words, if other counties catch up and they start doing diversion more robustly the way we've been doing it, instead of getting 50 bucks a kid, we might only get 30 or 20 or even 10. So I felt that it was appropriate to be very cautious about claiming that we're going to get $130,000 again from that line item. But I thought I should budget at least some of it because I thought half was a pretty safe number. And I, you know, and I just want to state that that is a good program, <coughs> program that you're doing it, and it's it's great that you're doing presentations to other communities, and it, it's showing good results. And, and I like to see that with our younger population, they make mistakes, and it's good if they get that and get that straightened out because they don't, at that age they don't understand the long-term consequences, just like you said of the drug arrest. And that's exactly right. I mean, that's what we're really looking at because we've got some good diversion and some good specialty courts, the drug court and the DUI court. I fully support, and again, we invest a lot of time and effort into those. But they're aimed at people who are just about to go to the pen, which means they're aimed at people who are in their late 30s, 40s, even 50s sometimes. And it's great if we can get them out of the system, but by then the system is already invested in them. They've had five or six drug cases. They've had 8, 10, 12 DUIs. We've invested and we've been at risk because of them. The goal with young adult diversion and juvenile diversion, both, uh, Commissioner LaCroix, is we get them out at the beginning and hopefully don't see them again. So I wanted to I kind have of, a question, Mark. Yes, sir. I like to pretend like I'm a judge and interrupt you right in the minute. <laughs> when you're, you know, in front of the Supremes, they interrupt you and on a different subject altogether. Yes, sir. You're talking about the AG opinion on Marcy's law. And are we going to obey that uh, because it's his opinion, or are we going to say, I don't think so, and if you don't like it, sue us? I don't know. And the, the sheriff and I talked last week. We are going to be sitting down with the, I'm going to talk to the state's attorneys around the state, see what the other people have in mind. He's going to talk to the sheriff's association. I know that Minnehaha is very worried about their ability to collect on, again, electronic monitoring 24-7, which they run as a vendor pay programs as well. So we both want to make sure that we can continue to run those. I don't know if we try to set up a test case and then fund it in the interim. I don't know if we basically dare somebody to sue us. I'm not a big fan of that as your lawyer, is Dave daring people to sue us. On the other hand, I actually think we would be right in this instance. And he's running for governor. So I've heard. Uh, and if you do have a bill before the legislature, why don't you add uh, to that bill that we can collect some of our costs uh, for pursuing restitution for these people? So, I mean, you go to a private attorney, you know, I've, I've been there and it's 30, 33%. Uh, maybe we should uh, add our, our costs to the restitution that it's their fault. No, just a thought. It probably never happened. Number well, <laughs> we, we do get the attorney fees. You know, we, we get those as an order and then a lien and then ultimately, in theory, restitution. That's largely one of those blood rock things that just doesn't work out very well for us Mac in the long run. MacArthur Grant, 150000 and, and this year, zero. Is that is that still a possibility, though? It's a possibility. I think, oh, in terms of whether we get it, I think it's Revenue. very, very likely. I'd put it in the upper 90s in terms of percentage chances. But I didn't think it was appropriate to put a guess. So you, your, your budget would change considerably then? 
Mine would not change so much. I would add that FTE back in because that's a grant numbers person that would be required basically to prove to MacArthur that we're doing what we're supposed to. So really what my budget would end up being is back to what you have in front of you. Like I said, I intend to take the one FTE out right now. I would put that person back. But what we would get out of it would be um, some additional spots over at the new uh, center, the former NAU building. So I believe that Barry would have some staff. I know that the jail would have some staff to do the Ray, to do those assessments. Those would be additional FTEs that we would anticipate, I think, adding back or at coming to the commission either to amend the budget, if we do it before September, or to get a supplement based on the MacArthur Foundation money coming in. And I, I do think it's extremely likely that we're going to be close to that million dollar. I guess my last point, and I don't expect you to answer it actually, because your competition is sitting in the back. But how do you, <laughs> how do you evaluate whether it should be a death penalty case or not? You know, when you say, yep, I think we're going to have the death penalty, you know how much money that costs us? I, I do. And, and not only to have the trial, but every year that he appeals it, it's more and more and more. And uh, now I see that the, the person that had the, I think it was a convenience store that stabbed the, the person 38 times, well, we might put that back in juvenile court. Jeez, I, I don't understand it. You know, when I worked over there, I, I was a death penalty guy for illegal parking, but uh, <laughs> eh, you know, I don't expect an answer. I can do that. Uh, so I want to end with just kind of giving you an idea of where I think we might be going in future years. I do think that at some point in the not too distant future, uh, our office has grown to the point that I believe that our office manager is torn in so many different directions. Uh, the functions that she serves are largely to work again with the other county agencies, a lot of the payroll and you know the money that comes through the office. Um, but then also she's responsible for all training and discipline and you know those kinds of things. I think we're getting to the point that we're going to need an assistant on that to maybe split those duties. Um, I do believe that we'll ultimately need an addition to felony capacity if our drug numbers and therefore our violent crime numbers don't start to go backwards. Um, because unfortunately, like I said, you take those big cases at the top of the ticket and the death penalty one, the capital case is by far the most obvious example of that. But the number of hours that those cases take, so take the juvenile, um, you know, the juvenile is not eligible for a death sentence or a life sentence because he was a juvenile. He's presumptively transferred to adult court, but the defense has the right to ask to bring him back to uh, juvenile court. And I can't even blame Eric for that because it's a privately retained attorney. Um, which does bring up my point, though, that we prosecute all the murder cases. They prosecute a few of them or deal with a few of them. Uh, and I do think that the position that we have as a data analyst or a grant writer, grant manager, uh, ultimately, like I said, I'm taking that out of this year's budget, hopefully putting it back in if and when we get the money from MacArthur. But I also believe that even after MacArthur, that might be a smart thing for a county of this size to have because that influx of, you know, maybe it's $100,000 one year, but it could be million dollar type grants like we were looking at from MacArthur. Having somebody who's an expert at that. One of the things that we got as feedback from the MacArthur folks was we just didn't write in the language they were expecting. Uh, and I went out to Chicago to, to talk about our young adult diversion program to a group of people out there. The former dean of the Northwestern Law School was there. She's a former MacArthur board member. And she was kind of joking about it and said, yeah, this is, it's silly but it's the way it is. You're writing to a specific audience, and if you don't hit their buttons, you, you reduce your chances. So I think ultimately those are probably three FTEs that in the next year to five years, we're probably going to, to need, if, again, if numbers don't, don't change. Mark, but I will, oh, I'm sorry to me. No, go ahead. I, I tend to agree with you on that, on that subject wholeheartedly. I, you know, I, I'm on a board with some of the, with a uh, facility that does a lot of that. And you're absolutely right. You know, you've got to be able to know where to look, how to write them, and, th and there's a lot out there, but finding the time and the resource to do that, I, I almost think that would be, would be a good investment for our, our county. 
And I think that what the, the nice thing will be, Commissioner, if we get this money from MacArthur, that person can start working not just on that, but the data then can be used for other things. And again, kind of like we do with a lot of different positions, my, one of them, you know, I told you would sunset. The others, we hope we prove the concept that this person has been useful and has been meaningful and has, you know, been of value to the county. But I will tell you that I specifically decided to forego asking for any FTE increases. And like I said, even I'm going to reduce by one because I do think it's important that we consider fully implementing the wage scale. It does create both morale and kind of compression problems when people who are hired two, three years ago make exactly the same amount as the people who come in tomorrow. And more importantly, I actually have some discretion in where I hire somebody. I don't have to hire them at the bottom of the scale, but I have no discretion to give somebody a raise if we don't have a step increase or a COLA. So once you're a county employee, the only way to give you a raise is either through the COLA and step increase in the annual budget or for me to fire you and rehire you, at which point I could actually give you a raise. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I do, I will tell you, it has, it causes some morale problems. People who've been here and who are doing extra work uh, because they are more experienced, when we lose those, it, we definitely take a hit. We lost one to a, we lost a secretary to a title company. We lost an attorney to the city. All of you knew Kinsley. Uh, we lost an attorney to the AG's office. And one of the assistant AG's is going to be a magistrate in the Fourth Circuit. So button up, you know, buckle up, here it comes. Because I'm guessing that uh, that's where, if I were Marty, that's where I'd start looking for staff is my office. And they pay better than we do. So... Mr. Vargo, um, do we have your supplements in here because we had remember, a shortfall and then we had Marcy's Law. Do we have those totals of supplements that you had? Yes, your 2017 numbers that we gave you are the 2017 approved, including the supplement. So that is our jumping off point. You know, that is what we included. And we've got our numbers right now. <laughs> you, Com you Commissioner know? DeSanto doesn't know the reference. Uh, <laughs> Let's just say there was an Excel spreadsheet error, and all the numbers were correct, but the number at the bottom did not add all of them. Ah. And that caused a lot quite a bit of consternation. <laughs> so, and again, we have the Marcy's Law. We added that supplement and then the shortfall, and then you've balanced that has, all this. Yep, that has been included in all of the 2017 numbers. Okay. Based on your average, it looked like it, but just making sure. Appreciate that. Thank you, sir. At this point, I'm not going to criticize, any, criticize anybody who wants to double check our uh, addition and subtraction. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Mark. All right. Paula and your steps together are 128,960, right? 1% based on CPI, and then your steps is. 62. Am I correct? 120. I'm showing. Am I wrong? On my cheat sheet, I'm showing the 1% COLA being 37.7, and it would be slightly less than that with one less FTE. Okay. And the steps being 71, 600 and some. And again, that'll be slightly less because uh, we're reducing that one FTE, but roughly $110,000 for the COLA and steps. Thank you. Guys, next we have public defender. Does anybody need a five minute break? Sure. Sorry, Eric. Okay. We don't have to make a motion for a break, do we? Yeah. Just give us five minutes, Eric. Very good. Everybody ready for Mr. Rich? Ready to rock. Okay. Now we're doing public defender. And you got no backup. That's the way it usually is. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a well-timed break. I like commissioners to be well-fed and happy. So, um, <clears throat> kind of summarize our budget this year. I think it's. Um, this reflects that uh, <clears throat> we, I think the first 
three times I appeared before you, we were always trying to catch up with the case assignments that we had. And we find, and, and I appreciate this commission's support of our office. We're, we're finally there. We, we have caught up. Um, we were also, every year, looking at oftentimes double-digit or close to double-digit increases in the case assignments. And that is not the case this year. Um, last year was flat, and this year our projections are relatively flat again. So that doesn't mean we're not busy. We've got, you know, we'll have over probably 6,000 cases assigned to us this year. And our felony levels continue to, to rise, but not in the same level that they used to. And most of the felony cases that we're handling are drug-related offenses. But we're, I, I think we've reached somewhat of a plateau in our community, I hope we have about with the methamphetamine um, epidemic. Doesn't mean it, we're in a good spot. There's still a lot of people out there using, but we're not seeing you know, the double digit increases like we had been before for the last several years. So I think we've flattened. Um, I certainly hope we're gonna start going down, but um, we haven't quite seen that happen yet. But um, the, uh, so it, as far as our misdemeanor numbers, are, they're very stable. They're looking like they're going to stay very similar over the next uh, uh, several years. And, and a lot of the rest of our, um, our numbers are also relatively stable. So uh, ANNs are ticking up this year. So I'm a little concerned about those. And, and just being in, I think one of the things that our office does is we go to what are called initial appearances that are in custody every morning and that's to try to get folks out of jail. So we meet with them briefly and make a quick bond argument before the judge. Um, just, there's a lot, of, a lot of people that we meet there that are, you know, their demographics are they have children, but they're also methamphetamine at, uh, addicts. And I'm, I'm a little concerned that that juvenile stuff is going to, um, we're gonna see that wave coming. Greece. but. Uh, outside of that, I don't see a whole lot of other headwinds coming in the next uh, year to two years, and I'm hoping for we'll get some tail, tailwinds. Uh, one piece of good news I have is, um, and some of you may not be aware, we had a storage facility of all of our files dating back to the beginning of the office from 1972 um, across the street. And uh, with the staff assistant position that you funded last year, um, he spent uh, weeks and weeks and weeks over there, and, and in accordance with our file retention policy, we've either destroyed files or moved them into our, our new office and into the archived files. And so we're going to have everything in, in that office here um, um, dating back to the 1970s with file retention, like, for example, a homicide case until we're, uh, we can verify that they're deceased. We'll keep that file indefinitely. So... So we have, uh, so that's nice to, uh, I'd been working on that for a while and it was, it was just such a monumental task. It, it needed, it's um, uh, a person to dedicate some time. We have plenty of things we're, we, we're excited for him to do, a lot of it at the back end of files, but, and also helping with our phones. Our phone volume is just, continues to be just astronomical. So even though we have, so it really needs a rotation. If we have one person in our staff assistance that's out, um, it, we get backlogged very quickly. So it does take two people almost constantly to handle both our incoming traffic as well as our phone traffic. So, so that, that's gonna be a, a critical component of that, that position. Um, you know, I think, uh, th you know, I'm also very pleased with the quality of our staff and our attorneys. They're, they, they just work so hard and do such an amazing job. One of the things that we do um, is I send out surveys because my solemn responsibility is to, is to advocate on behalf of our clients and give them professional and, and legal services. And we send out surveys. And there's a few people that aren't happy, but for the most part, our, the, the, the folks that are um, using our service at the public defender are generally happy with their service. And oftentimes we'll rank their attorney and their, um, and their and our staff as a 10 out of a possible 10. 
for the advocacy. <coughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a couple of sort of interesting things with that data. One of the questions I ask as a public defender is as, uh, as good as a private attorney. You know, if they thought they'll give us all tens for the whole office, they might give it a five. You know, it's still, public defender is still not as good, but even though they had a, they had a great experience at our office. Um, the, other, the other one of the questions I have is, did we give you the time and attention that you believe your case deserved? And that we tend to score a little bit lower, and that's, that's a product of us being busy. You know, we have, you know, we don't have, if you've been in our office for at least six, we try to on-ramp slowly, but if you've been in our office for six months, you've got 100 active files. And when you start dividing that out by time, how much time you can <coughs> devote to any individual person um, at any given week is, is very short. So we have to be extremely efficient. But, um, but at the same time, I, um, we're not asking for any additional FTEs this year. We should be able to manage our caseload with the attorneys that we have. And so I'm, I'm, uh, and I'm hoping that's gonna be a, a, a long-term trend. It is, it is, we are in a diff, difficult market right now for attorneys. We just are. We're having um, coffee with Mr. Vargo and, and, and Judge Fifley this morning, and we're all discussing how to recruit attorneys to come, to come work here, and it's, it's a challenge. So, um, you know, I'm, I would love to see us start to go down. I've been providing my number. I think data is really critical for what we do. And I've been providing those numbers, and I mean, I'm really hoping that there'll be a day where I can start going down. It'd be a lot easier to run 16, 17 attorneys than it is 19. It's it's a real challenge to keep us fully staffed. Um, with, as far as our uh, budget is concerned, I mean, what um, there's a few line item changes as we always continue to, to uh, change things as 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 we see things. Uh, develop over time, but I, I think the, the most important thing that I'd like to advocate this year is, is for those step increases. I, I did catch the tail end of Mr. Vargo's presentation and, and, and doing per performance evaluations, it's, it's difficult when you, you can say, I, I can't imagine how you can do a better job. You're, you're, you're here on time, you work like crazy, you solve problems all day long, um, but I can't provide you <laughs> any any raise at the end of the year. Um, and it does create those compression issues where um, I have, you know, some of our, our felony attorneys that are, are working uh, incredibly difficult caseloads and they make us, you know, a matter of a few hundred dollars difference compared to somebody who just arrives at our office, um, who is only gonna be able to handle misdemeanors for probably a year. So. That, that creates that compression issue. So any, um, so I would advocate on behalf of them to uh, consider um, those merit in, or those step increases or wage scale adjustments or whatever the, the, the terminology is there so that we can avoid some of that compression and give people an opportunity to, to make a little bit more. We're not gonna, we lose people too, just like Mark does, and, and we're not gonna be able to save all of those, but I know in talking with our staff when, when budgets finalize sometime in the early fall and they know there's no raise coming the following year, then they're really looking at you know, 18 months or close to it of not making or getting a raise. And that becomes a little demoralizing and they start looking just to see what's out there. And if they find something, they might take it. So um, we have a lot of folks that end up leaving for you know, private practice and we lost two to the federal public defenders, and it's just, they pay a lot more than, than we can, so not much we can do about those, but we can keep people from looking, and I think one of them wouldn't have looked if they would have had a raise coming this year. Even if it had been a $2,000 raise, it's, it's just, Cyrus, that's, it's both uh, financially important, but also psychologically important, so I'd like to advocate on behalf of them and um, uh, to, to strongly consider that for this year's budget. But beyond that, I'm not requesting any other FTEs. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I guess I do. Sure. Uh, you know, I see 50,000 less in group insurance. Mm -hmm. you must, I know you had a couple of deaths in the family, but uh, yeah. and just the replacements don't, didn't need the same insurance or something? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's what it was. I... Um, you know, I, 
and I did last year's budget and Jody had started it and then I ended up taking that that over and I, and I was looking at I think the actuals when I made that projection but we had several different staffing changes through that and it must be uh, what it is or else I messed up in figuring last year I don't really know but um, but yeah that we were substantially uh, off on that so we're able to take that down quite a bit and how about phone and fax that's quite an increase oh sure what that is um, I've been waiting here for a couple of years to look at reimbursing uh, attorneys for cell phone usage and I know the state's attorney's office has been doing that for a while now and so that's what that is so it's fifty dollars a month as sort of a subsidy because we've been looking at the various options we buy them a county phone um, they can't the way uh, the system works from IT we we, we can't have them uh, it, it, if they're going to use our data then we well a little complicated but this is going to what we decided to do with the attorneys is to do fifty dollars subsidy to their their plans they just keep their own plan and then we don't have to worry about maintaining that uh, an actual phone so then they'd have to have two phones they can't do private uh work on the county phone so that's what people <coughs> seem to prefer and they, they use them constantly while they're in court and and uh we're waiting for court more more aptly so I think we probably all know the answer, but the elephant in the room is the two hundred and twenty-six thousand mm -hmm. dollars witness fees. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's um, you know that's based upon uh, us being assigned a, a death penalty case. So it's they are extremely expensive today's world. What that means for us to to do uh, our solemn responsibility to do our due diligence in those cases requires substantial uh, expenditures of experts. And the experts that are necessary to do these or, or else we haven't met our responsibilities and due diligence and, and then oftentimes they'll be reversed on appeal and you, you pay for them multiple times. So, and, and that's, you know, our, our first responsibility, of course, is to do our best work for our client and to advocate for them. But th these are just extremely expensive. The what you can um, range is, you know, depending upon the complexity of the case. And and I, I can't talk about that. There is a gag order on it, but the complexity. This is an extremely complex case. And the evaluations are psychiatric evaluations for them. There, there can be a number of things. There's both the guilt phase as well as the penalty phase. So um, there can be psychiatric evaluations. And and to to that point, there was a United States Supreme Court case that came out earlier this week, where it was a reversal based upon the. Um, the defense had requested an independent psychological evaluation and it was denied and 31 years later that case was reversed and now we're going to go back and do it again so to it's uh it's crucial there, there's no stakes higher than seeking the death penalty and it's a it creates tremendous strain on the, the attorneys the our, our staff, our, our office, et cetera, but, but it also is extremely expensive. They're very, very costly events. And where do, if you have a death penalty, I suppose you have outside counsel. Where yep. does that come in? Is that the, under our court expenses? That, that will, yep, that's exactly right. That'll come out of the court. So in any death penalty case, the court generally will assign two attorneys. So our office is on one half of that, and, and Mike Stonefield was former director of our office is, is on, is the private counsel in that matter. Now, this particular death penalty case, there's two co-defendants where they are seeking the death penalty. So there are two private attorneys on the, in the co-defendant case. So all that will come through um, the, uh, the court appointed attorney budget as well as the witness, they're gonna have this similar expenses to us. I, my, I expect, I don't know, I don't know their case. and. Um, but they're going to have substantial costs as well coming through on that sort of witness budget. Ours will come through here. That case will go through 
what Judge Fife will be discussing with you whenever his time is in front of you. So, thanks, Eric. Yep. At the beginning of, uh, of your address, you were talking about 6,000 6, cases, is, mm -hmm. is what you're defending. So, just so that I can figure out the, the relationship between arrests and how many people you defend, there's 9,229 arrests in 2016. And you only defended 6,000 of them. What's, where's the difference? Well, some people, Not everybody gets defended, obviously. That's right. So some people will appear pro se and will just handle their matter pro se and some hire private counsel. Okay. So, and then some we, we can catch. We catch a lot of conflicts before they're assigned to our office. We know, for example, that two people got arrested in the same car. We can't represent both of those people. So we'll right away, that'll get go to what's called Dakota Plains, which mm -hmm. will be another part of your, which is uh, the conflict office. So that's where those end up. So that, that's gonna be the discrepancy between arrests and, and the numbers that we represent. Thanks. Yep. <clears throat> Eric, I think, uh, man, I've never been so enlightened on the death penalty deal as this. I'm shocked to see the prices, you know, when we were talking about that. Mm -hmm. One of my other questions, and I should ask, Mark, the same question, because I think, you know, you talk about this young person that you got to help do some work. You know, uh, I really encourage the city to get young people in to help uh, job training, on the job training, because I think you're, you're saying the attorneys, it's tough in our area. People, I, the enrollment's down. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things happening, and, and, I always think of how do we get the younger people interested in it? Is there a way with the city attorneys with an internship or the, your, your department, sure. public defenders yeah. and marks, you know, some way to get them. We, um, we do have interns that come and they're here in the summer. It makes, it makes a tremendous difference to us. You know, since we've had an open position for a while now, I actually got two, 1L positions, and all they can do is write briefs, but they make such a difference. Yeah. So they're law students, and so we try to bring them in to, to let them know what we're about and to hopefully encourage them to later uh, consider us for employment. Um, we also have two second-year law students. Um, we have, in the past, hired um, as seasonal employees some interns that were just college students that are looking at law as a potential. Um, the, what helps with law students is one else can do legal research and writing. So they can actually take some things off of our plate. Someone who's a college student uh, who, is, who hasn't been trained at all yet, um, they, they can help answer phones, do filing, and there's, we, there's lots of great things for them to do. They don't necessarily take a lot of pressure off of lawyers. And then our two L's, they can actually go to court, and it's by the consent of the defendant. Um, and, and we go through all the, that's a written and, and filed, and they have to be approved by the Supreme Court to be able to do so. But we give them their own files, and, um, and so they're, they're supervised so closely. It, it, it takes some pressure off, but at the same time, when you're training and supervising, it's, but it's it's a I think it's a it's a great experience for them, um, and it's um, I think one of the great ways to to learn how to do something is to teach somebody else, and so it gives lots of our lawyers that opportunity. But but yeah, we and you know part of the the issue is during the recession, a lot of people went to law school because they couldn't find a job anyway, and we had a lot of talent out there. Um, now, what ended up happening, though, is so many of those people couldn't find a job, so they were $120,000 in debt, unable to find a legal job at all, and, and law schools have to report this information that they're only placing this many people in, in a law uh, job, and, and, and so a lot of people left the law school. <laughs> so now admissions are really down for law schools. So there's a smaller uh, pool available, but now the marketplace has, has rebounded. So there's work out there. A lot of people are hiring attorneys, and so there's a lot of demand. 
So it's a supply and it's just a simple supply and demand issue. The problem with law schools, it's kind of like turning the Titanic. It takes three years because by the time that admission process happens and, and they're out, uh, it, it takes a while. So it'll correct itself, but we're going to be in for a, a couple of really, I think, lean years to try to recruit people to come and work for us here. Thanks, Eric. No. Would we benefit by maybe a program that a lot of businesses have where we have somebody working for us that we put through or we promise to pay through mm -hmm. school as long as they agree to contract with us for four years or five years or something like that. Would that be an incentive and would that be a financially feasible um, or a benefit to the county to do something, a program like that? I. You know, it's a, it's a, it'd be a very expensive proposition. So it's like a, it's, it's about a hundred thousand dollars plus to go to law school now. Right. So that, that's, um, I don't know for sure if we would see the benefit out of that. I think, I would want to try a couple things before that. Um, I think one of the things that I'm interested in doing, you know, and maybe trying it next year, especially if I don't need another. If I if I if our if our numbers go down a little bit, it'd be nice to try this as to to sort of leave an FTE unfilled, and and to be able to recruit an attorney a year in advance because the the way the hiring works in the law is all the firms, the court system, they're at the law school coming this fall talking to third year law students who have another year to go, and they offer them a job right then. And, and guarantee them a spot as soon as they're, they're done. Well, the most, the people with the best grades and the most talent and et cetera, et cetera, they get jobs right then. And the, the difficulty with working in, in a governmental agency, I can't guarantee them that I'm gonna have an FTE available. I couldn't leave one open for a year. I mean, we're, we're just way too busy to do that. So I'd, I'd so I, I can't I can't guarantee them a spot. I've lost several attorneys who wanted to come work for us, who had interned with us or whatever, by just unable to to offer them a job and say, I guarantee you, you'll get a spot. So then they end up going someplace where they can guarantee a spot. So um, I I'd like to try that first <laughs> before uh, I'm I'm afraid that that expenditure would be awfully high and we wouldn't see the return. I don't think so. And, and then, you know, the dropout rate in law school is fairly high, too. So 20% <clears throat> shot, maybe higher, that they're not even going to graduate. And It's not a bad idea, though, because no. right now there is a program for small communities that they've either lost their attorney or don't have one, that if they pay part of the, the third-year law students' uh, expense. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think they pay for schooling, but they do pay for some of their salary the first year, mm -hmm. and, the, and the bar will pay for some of the salary the first year. And, and they're trying to recruit these younger attorneys into those small towns that mm -hmm. don't have any. Yeah. And you know the saying, you know, an attorney, one attorney in a small town uh, starves to death, two of them both become rich. So. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, <he's not> <laughs> Always bus screwed in those attorney jokes. Yeah. <laughs> I like right. your idea, though. I mean, at least we're mm -hmm. aware of it now. I mean, that's at least having that flexibility with the funding at the FTE. Right. When you're going recruiting to the schools, it could help. Mm -hmm. It'd be frustrating not being able to guarantee somebody. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. wait about six months till I see the commission? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, and, and uh, part of what we had the you know the attrition for an office our size we're going to lose probably three or four attorneys a year i mean that's just that's sort of the reality of it so i i think i can in th I, I think i could guarantee somebody i'm going to have a spot but i can't quite guarantee it, you know it's probably going to be there but i but I, if i ended up in a situation where oh, i didn't lose anyone then um you know i'd either have to let somebody go or um or not give them a spot, and that you don't necessarily want to be in that dilemma. Your thought is, have the commission authorize you an FTE 
at the beginning of the year in thought that mm -hmm. there could be a possibility we could attract somebody by promising them in advance, you got a job. And, and the way I was thinking of it in my mind is to be almost like a, maybe a 30% funded FTE for an attorney because the odds of me not having, you know, if I had an opening a couple, three months ahead of time, I'd just use that opening. Or, you know, I, and I'd have about three or four months that I could pay for them through the, the balance of that year just in case I didn't lose somebody. I, I mean, I, my expectation is I would never really need the money, but it would just be give me a little bit of, a, of wiggle room. To, that way I can, you know, confidently say you for sure get a, you get a job coming. So, all right. Nice. I want to say that Eric is doing a great job. He, uh, what did we decide? You were the third or fourth largest law firm in Rapid City. So that's who that's who he manages by himself, and uh, most of those foreign firms have three or four people at the top. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's got a real job. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Holly, are you up next? Go up much. All right, the commission budget as prepared has a $5,500 increase. And we'll just go ahead and start at the top in salaries. Um, I also prepared for you guys the narrative that breaks down each individual line item that we have and what gets paid out of there. But personnel services um, just has my position and Andy's position and then the five commissioners. Um, this is the time for the board to discuss what your salary will be for next year. Um, state law directs you to set your salaries at the first meeting of each year, but this is the time that we need to agree on a number so that we have the appropriate amount. Um, I did not put an increase in. It's in at $1,500 a month for each commissioner. If this board wishes to change it, now's the time to discuss it. Anybody have a proposal? I would make a recommendation that we leave our salaries the same. I have one thought, and I expressed it to a couple people. You know, there was such big talk about the jump last or two years ago. Um, <clears throat> To me, the, the chairman of, of the commission has to put in more time in the building. And one of the things that I discussed when I went to every department head was they wish they could, a person could spend more time to commission themselves. They see them once in a while. The only time they usually see them is when there's a problem or they want something. My thought process was the requirement for the chairman, his time is higher. We, you know, most of us have aren't retired. So. <laughs> but <coughs> just, just the discussion over the raises, my thought process was each commissioner give up a hundred dollars and turn it over. Whoever gets chairman gets paid an additional hundred dollars, would be four hundred one from each commissioner for the additional time that it takes. That gives an incentive for someone to step up and be chairman, and it gives the chairman a little active, to my, in my mind, the person a little bit of relaxed time that they can devote some more personal time. It's just a thought. I, I think about it. I was thinking there was the discussion over the raise from the year before, you know what I'm saying? That would bring it back down, and in, in all reality, I think put it to where it sh probably should be. You, know, you have more responsibility. That's just my thought. I, 
I don't think we have to make a decision today. And that would be starting next year, not yes, this year. Yes, yeah, okay. next year. So actually, you'd be reduced. My thought is you'd be. It's up to the commission. You could either reduce each commission member a hundred bucks, or you can keep it the same and maybe add. I don't know. You guys, it's open for discussion. Have they ever done that before, Holly? It was proposed probably in my second or third year here. Um, it wasn't a reduction in the others. It was just an increase. I think at that time it was $300 extra for the chair. Um, and that person ended up refusing it anyway. And I, I think that was a personal choice of the chair at that time. But it... I'm not sure if anybody else does it. You know, other counties or not. I didn't really do any research on it, but you know... Um, I think there are some out there. Yeah. I think there are. Um, we've done salary studies on commissioners before. I can tell you, you guys are still on the lower end of the scale for what commissioners gets paid across the state. But again, that's always been a personal decision of the board. Um, but yes, there are some chairs that are higher because of the amount of time that they're required to be in here. Yeah. And I believe the pay, and I was going to second your motion, Mr. DeSanto, but I wanted to hear a discussion is good. But I, I think um, from sitting in the middle and then being on this commission, I think I'd rather put the money into some type of audio to be able to push a button instead of have people put their finger up or do different things to try to acknowledge people because you can't really see. And sometimes it becomes a little bit chaotic when... Um, People get excited, which we know, <laughs> and uh, it makes it more. Um, oh, you mean so you have a panel in front of you so you know which chairman or which yeah, uh, then commissioners you just wants to speak. Push your button, and then it has a line, <coughs> and it makes it very orderly just from doing city council um, that way and being the chair on, like, public works and county pre or city president and all that. Um, but if, if I, uh, uh, as chairman, um, I think that's a good suggestion as well, Lloyd, but if we have extra money um, that we could put into something, I think it'd make it more efficient. And then our Skyping, it's uh, for people like the Department of Transportation and different people that Skype in and some of that stuff. Some of the equipment that Holly's talking about, is that some of that $10,000 increase to upgrade some of that? No, that is not. Um, okay. I'll talk about that here in just a second. Okay. Um, so if there's no, I mean, you don't have to make a decision right now on the salaries. I just, at some point before the end of this, when we finalize budgets, we'll need to make a decision so we can get the accurate number in. We don't want to come in in January and have a surprise and not have the money in the budget. Um, so I we can do that. Insurance went down. Um, a lot for a, a small department like ours, so that that was a help. Um, if we move down into publishing um, for the new commissioners, the commission office publishing budget is really tough because it depends on what everybody else does during that year, and I have no control over that. Um, just one example for you, the commission meeting that this board approved the alternative energy ordinance just that one meeting to publish our minutes cost me just over $5,000 just to publish minutes. It's, in my opinion, ridiculous. That is but ridiculous. <laughs> newspaper rates are set by statute. Um, it's, it's tough to estimate publishing budget. We pay for all of the bid notices. We pay for all of the liquor license notices, our minutes, equalization hearings. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot of money that we spend every pages, year. How many pages, Holly, was, was our minutes for that that cost us five grand? I can, I've got the, one of the um, actual legals. I can show it to you. Um, I don't know that I'd be able to tell you a page count because newspapers are by column. Right. Um, but like we didn't take up an entire page? Oh, then? yeah, absolutely we did. A couple of pages. Be, and it, again, it was, it was kind of an anomaly because it was that alternative energy ordinance. But we also have the construction permit ordinance that's going to be coming forward. We've got the mining ordinance that's going to be coming forward. We're redoing our comp plan. 
Um, my publishing budget for 18 might be scary because of all of those upcoming things that this board is changing. And those costs are set by statute? Correct. Correct. You don't have to publish any ordinance. That is, like, if we would adopt a building code, we wouldn't have to publish that whole thing because that's an accepted ordinance. But when, when you start talking the one she's talking about, I'm afraid they probably do have to be published. Yeah, they, they definitely that's, do. That's in the law, too, and you know, it kind of gives you options, but some of them aren't options. They've tried for many years to change the law to allow us to put it online in addition. It, it's just never gone anywhere. It's, it's just always felt that the legals are the important medium to contact with your constituents so um, um one thought you to publish i have and and lloyd um being the chair um i'll just say it up straight and, and i i know the department heads can back me up holly does a lot of the work for us and if and also if we had to increase somebody's salary i'm going to say it up straight Holly deserves an increase in salary. I don't know if you guys actually sit in that office, which we all have. She does a lot of work for this department and other departments and just does it. And it's amazing. So if there's anything that we could do, um, I don't want to increase in my salary, but if, if any way that we could give Holly some type of increase in hers, um, I think it's well deserved, and she's go gone above and beyond for all of us in many areas in this department to get our uh, stuff done and be very um, efficient. So um, I'm not proposing it right now because she doesn't even know I was going to bring this up, but and I haven't brought it up to anybody else. But Rochford Road or any big project, Kroll or anything, holy cow, guys. The, the material is spot on. She's got the people we want here, and it, it's just um, so efficient. So we appreciate we appreciate Andy and Holly, but um, Holly, you just have done a tremendous job at holding the line on, on many things that we do. She works on our budgets with the staff and other people as well. So, um, Thank you. I appreciate those kind words. That I did not know this government world existed before I came here. It was... It's been an adventure the last nine years. <laughs> well, you know it pretty well, it seems like. <laughs> That's the one thing. Yeah, good retention, Andy and I, Holly. <laughs> Andy and I work in this office. We know a little bit about a whole lot of stuff. So you can certainly call us. If we don't know it, we'll get you to where you need to be. I mean, we have those connections and those relationships. And, um, and I haven't looked into how the increase or how we do it, so I will look into it. But... Um, I'll probably be bringing that up at some point, um, an increase in her budget for her salary. So, you, I appreciate that. Uh, I, I would tend to agree that you bring something back, present it to us as chairman, and and because I, I feel the same way. I mean, I don't know about Mark, but I don't have time to do a lot of stuff. So, I make the phone call to the first person. <laughs> You know, and I say, can you look at this? And, and she gets on it and gets back to me. And, and I'm usually on the run every time I'm doing something. So yeah. I appreciate it. Um, the, the going wage, into the next. Hold on, Hall. I was just going to tell him the wage thing that I was talking about was just, a, I was just planting the seed. If it doesn't get water, it doesn't get water. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, you know, every suggestion uh, moving forward, uh, Lloyd, that's what we're here for. So. Um, it's a good suggestion. I like your suggestion also, Deb, putting a uh, lighting system there to know who's, because there is quite often times when you're focused on something else and there's a lot of things to think about as chair um, for whoever's sitting in that chair. Right. Uh, yeah. It would be nice to have something like to alert you that Ron over here, because I'm leaning forward, Yeah. is going, hey, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> That's, I, I like that idea. Yeah. So maybe we could look into something, Holly, and maybe um, bring back some type of number that would... I can do that. Okay, um, thank you. Going into that next um, line item of repairs and maintenance, 
you know, when we built this facility, um, this system in this room encompassing our conference room is about $140,000. Um, at that time, it was all brand new. I hate to pass the buck and put it on the former IT director, but he, he pushed for not going for the maintenance and support agreement. Um, now that we're in here, we're starting to have some glitches that need that additional technical support. And I would like to move forward and enter into an annual maintenance agreement with our vendor to, they come out here twice a year, update our software. I mean, we have a full-fledged broadcast system in there and, and it's technical. It needs that next level um, support that, that Andy and I just don't have the ability. Um, so that's, that's that $10,000 increase. Um, this year, I went a little bit over and we've upgraded our Skype. We, um, I was out of audio ports, so I did purchase four additional audio ports, which now allows the Skype recipient to hear the audio direct instead of us trying to like wire a microphone outside and it was just messy. So now that we've had more and more requests to Skype in, the system is now upgraded and is able to do that very easily. Um, so that piece we have done. Um, the speaker control system, if that's something that the board wants to do, um, I did get a quote last year. Um, I'm sure it's gone up. We'll have to readdress exactly what the board um, would want. We can reuse the one of the control panels over there that isn't utilized the way we intended it to be. So there might be some cost savings there, um, but I will certainly get that information put together and bring it back. Is that a speaker upgrade or a speaker, what do you mean, the speaker control speaker system? Speaker control system, it's here. basically just going to put a wireless panel in front of whoever would be the chair and wherever. I don't want to hardwire it in because I've had chairs that like to sit on one end versus the other so they can oh. see better. So I'd hate to hardwire it in the middle, but a wireless one would allow them to sit wherever. But it would basically just be a it's speaker control system that would allow whoever wants to speak to press a button or queue up and would alert whoever's oh, the okay, chair right. okay. gotcha. to know which order to go in. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I think there's different options. I know we can rewire these mics somehow so that they're always off and you'd have to press them to speak. I'm not necessarily in support of that quite yet. Um, I think that'd be more burdensome on whoever's the commissioner to hold it down and it just seems like it's I'm not sold yet I think for the first couple of months somebody would be reminding us constantly to push a button well <laughs> and, and I think but after a while I think we'd get it we'd not it picking out. up on the recording would be another huge downfall mm -hmm. um, I don't want to start creating technical issues there either so okay. I will contact AVI again we'll see what what's out there, what works, and bring it back for your decision, do direction. You, do you have any idea what that maintenance agreement would run us? My maintenance agreement is going to be a little over 10000 For the whole year? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad that I've heard some positive comments about the speaker button. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I really am. Because I, I, that was one of the things I was going to ask you, Holly, about the budget as far as IT and technology for the commission. And I've seen that you upped it for the maintenance agreement, which I, I agree with because you have to keep it up or it's going to go down. But I'm, I'm still thinking bigger than just the speaker boxes as far as technology. And I'm trying to get away from all the paperwork. And I eventually will just use the computer because my office at home is, is trashed with, with all the paperwork <laughs> that I've got. You've just started. I know. Just wait. So <laughs> You'll have more coming. <laughs> I want to get to that point. You know, and one of the things when I was at the county, the, the regional county uh, meetings That's in Meade County, is that I think they actually had a monitor for each commissioner up there. But I, I just happened to glance and look and see it. I don't know, but I think somewhere along the line we may may want to put some money aside like some of these other departments for technology upgrade you know i mean to get to the point where we want to go to have your entire packet in front of you all the time or 
you want to see what's up here closer in front of you. No, you know, they had their own monitors so they could view the packet themselves online or however they instead want of instead of a separate laptop. laptop. Yeah. yeah, instead of a laptop. I don't know. Laptops cheaper, I'm sure. I don't know how that went, but you know, I'm just I'm just throwing that out there that you know, in the future we, we may want to We tested tablets a few years ago. Um, Ron might be able to speak to this more. It I think it just they were too cumbersome and people like to take their notes and we couldn't get an app that would easily allow you to write on the pdf and the technology wasn't there at that time you know we're all well don't and like everybody's change. different we don't like change it took my wife forever to get a phone because she didn't <laughs> want to learn how to do the iphone <laughs> so you're, you're talking to the i hate change master right here <laughs> Well, and paper's hard to go away from. It, it, is. it really I mean, is. It's a I transition, mean, and, and, and I'm understanding because I'm trying to do it, get away from it with what we're doing. But I think uh, the last time I did an average, each packet was costing like $34, $35 to create a paper packet. And you guys know you're about 250 to 600 pages per packet sometimes, so... Um, anyway, you know, we certainly look for cost savings any way we can come up with them. We recycle the packets. Um, we're almost all electronic now for storing packets. Um, so that's been a big savings for us too, but. Any other questions for Holly? Nope. Thank you. Good job. Thank you guys. Thanks, Holly. Thanks, Holly. Good discussion today, board. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Recess. 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 Recess, please. All right. That's what I meant. Second to recess. <laughs> Time to play. Motion by Busker. Second by LaCroix. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries.